Number two, we are going to talk today about a little bit of the prophecy that Jesus is there to fulfill and also the angel Gabriel and also what happens the night of his birth. And this is really exciting. Um, there's a lot of groundwork. The reason why we're spending so much time on the front end is there's so much theology that goes into the first three or four pages of any book that uh, is foreshadowing of everything else. So this is really going to set us up well for that. I put as the, the picture three pictures because we're studying the Gospel of Luke actually in three different sections. And rather than doing them entirely chronologically, we're really doing them by themes. So the first section, which we're doing now, is the birth narrative of Jesus. Last time we talked about how Mary was a prophetess in her own right. And when she sings the Magnificat, the words she says, the mighty will be thrown down and the lowly will be lifted up, are the same words that Jesus uses in his first sermon in chapter 4 when he reads from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, uh, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the the uh, lowly will be lifted up and the mighty will be cast down. So this, this time tonight, in the end of this first third of Bible study, we're talking about this, the manger scene over here. And then when we take two weeks off and then we come back, we're going to spend three weeks on the parables that are in Luke. And when we take three weeks off after that, because that includes Thanksgiving, when we uh, come back after Thanksgiving at the end of November, we'll talk about Jesus in his last three days. So that's where we're going. There are three pictures up here to talk about those three things. A little bit of reminder of where we've been. Luke is not intended to be an eyewitness to the account. We believe that he's writing after the temple is to be destroyed, after the temple is destroyed. And like Matthew and like Mark, writing after the temple is destroyed colors the things that they write. So in Luke, even though we believe Luke was probably a Gentile Christian and not a Jewish first Christian, he centers all of Jesus' ministry around the temple. In fact, as soon as Jesus is born, the first thing they're going to do is take him to the temple in Jerusalem. And if you read Luke and Acts together, because the, there are two volumes of the same book, the very first thing that Paul does is starts where? Guess where? at the temple in Jerusalem. So Jesus and Paul both start at the temple when, as soon as their ministry begins. And it's, it's a, a reminder of God's promise to us, but it's also a reminder of the situation we live in where we are being oppressed. So it is both hope and pain together. That's what the temple represents in this time. Uh, for many of us, it, it, it would be like the World Trade Center if that also carried a heavy religious significance. The temple was believed to be where God dwelled. So the very first annunciation, the very first proclamation that a baby is going to be born happens to Zechariah, and it happens where? In the temple, inside the Holy of Holies, right smack dab in the temple. And that the angel Gabriel appears to him in the Holy of Holies and he, it scares him so much, right? And he's saying, um, how can this be? Because I'm old and my wife, does he say his wife's old, remember? No, he says, she's getting on in years. <laughs> and how can this be that we are going to have a baby? And the angel makes him mute. And I suggested to you last week that that was a little bit of a punishment for him. We're actually going to see this week how that story ends for Zechariah. But the interesting juxtaposition is that Zechariah and Mary have very similar and yet opposite encounters with the angel Gabriel. Where Zechariah is a man, Mary is a little girl. Where Zechariah is a high priest, Mary is of no status. Where Zechariah is in the temple, Mary is in her house somewhere. And the irony is, when Zechariah hears that his wife will have a baby, even though she's above childbearing years, he says, how can this happen? But the irony there, of course, is that God has many times over given women who were above childbearing years the ability to have children. Do you know, any, do you know one of those stories? Yeah. 
Sarah and Abraham. That's right. So a good Jew would believe that. So there's a disconnect for Zechariah between his head knowledge of his religion and the faith that, that counts for his everyday living. We might say that there's a disconnect between what he teaches and what he internalizes. So we get this story from Luke and it's supposed to be an orderly account. And I've, I'm encouraging you to not confuse that with the genre of history. It's not trying to be historical, and that actually is going to show up in today's lesson. But it's much more like a sermon, right? A sermon takes a story that you already know and then weaves it together with current reality in a way that appeals to your life today. One of the greatest words that appears most often in Luke is the word today. In fact, even on the cross, he turns to the thief and says what? Today, today you will be with me in paradise. Not off in the future, but today. The angel Gabriel, in, in today's lesson, he gets to the shepherds and he says, Today is born for you in the city of David a Savior, the Messiah, who is Christ the Lord. Today is a, a, big scene, a, a big reason for that. So it reads a little bit like a sermon. So it's not quite orderly in the way we would think historical, but it's orderly in that it's theologically sound. It makes sense within its own borders. He took a bunch of fragments. Remember I told you it was a little bit like a museum. And he's curated them so that they're all together. All right, I showed you this picture last time, and I want to show it to you again because it, it speaks a lot to the, what's happening here. I suggested to you that the baby Jesus and Mary are both holding the Bible together, and it's open to the page of the ninth hour, which is the time that Jesus died. So in this moment, Mary is consoling her baby, as you would, but also the baby is consoling Mary, and together they're holding scripture. And I suggested to you that Mary is a prophetess, that she delivers these great words that Jesus then picks up later. But today we're also going to talk about the rift between Mary and Jesus. We're going to talk about the sword that Simeon promises. Okay, Zachariah and Mary are read as opposite stories in many ways. And at the end of the Annunciation, Annunciation is an announcement, that's when Gabriel appears and he announces to both of them that you're going to have a child, and they're like, what? One of them is made mute, that's Zachariah, and one of them sings, and that's Mary. Now, n neither of those are the end of the story, of course. Um, but there, there's a question there where Zachariah starts to say in disbelief, how can this be? And Mary's, how can this be, has much more to do with um, exactly what's going to happen next. And then Mary sings this song, this Magnificat. And it reminds us of the sermon that Jesus preaches. All right, so we're going to start back at the beginning. John the Baptist is announced in the temple, and he moves to the wilderness. So by the time they're adults, so John the Baptist is Zachariah's son, and does he carry on the strong priestly tradition of staying close to the church? No. He is like the pastor's son who gets a bunch of tattoos and a Harley and heads out, you know, to a Joshua tree, right? He's just, he goes way, way out. Conversely, Jesus is announced to Mary in Nazareth in some backwater town and that he ends up at the temple and uh, I put this, this here. I know you can't see it too well because I literally took a picture of my book with my iPhone. Um, but you can see that the story's parallel. And in general, the sections 
where Jesus, like let's say the circumcision of Jesus is shorter and John's is longer, but Jesus in the temple is much, much longer than John going to the wilderness. And the birth of John is two, chapter, two verses where the birth, birth of Jesus is uh, about eight. So there's, uh, there's, there's some sort of uh, movement and flow, but if you look all the way down at the bottom, if you take out the songs that they sing, and we believe these songs were part of the early church. These are the first hymns, right? They get brought in here, the Annunciation and the, uh, the Magnificat. And of course, we always sing those on, uh, in Advent. Um, uh, we, we know those words because we sing them, and they knew those words because they sang them, and they ended up in the gospel because people were already singing them. But if you take those songs out, you see that they have a very similar balance. Annunciation, birth, circumcision, and then where they're going from there. But the irony, of course, is that they're a little bit backwards in some sense, that John the Baptist should be the one that ends up in the temple. And Jesus is the one that should end up in the wilderness if you're just going by their birth story, right? Uh, because John is born to the wealthy inner circle and Jesus is born outside of the system entirely. Okay. <clears throat> Peggy, would you read this for us? Okay, thank you. So you can tell by this, if you, if you had read Mark first, you would know that, you know, Mark tries to make everything simple. He doesn't add a lot of flourish, but this is drama. Can you feel that this is drama a little bit, right? And we know, because we're in the head of the, uh, the author, that this has already been announced. His name's going to be John. That's what the angel Gabriel told Zachariah in the Holy of Holies right before he made him mute. Okay, but the crowd doesn't know this. The crowd and the people around are always a hidden uh, a character in the narrative in the Gospel of Luke. There will always be a crowd in almost every scene. There'll be bystanders, and it's their, their amazement about what's going on that fuels the, uh, the uh, uh, mystery of the Gospel. And in it, they say, uh, so Jewish custom is that the father names the child. That's Jewish custom. Why? Because you don't always know who the father is. And there's no paternity tests. There's no Maury TV show, right, to find out who the father is. So the way that you established paternity was that the father names the child, okay? The irony is Zachariah can't name the child. Why not? He's mute, okay? Which means he can't claim this child right now. The other irony is the name that if he had his voice, everyone assumes that he would say is what? Zachariah. Why? Because it's his name. And he wants to name him like him. And then they say, John, John, such a gutter name, John, right? We're going to name him John. And then they politely tell Zachariah, or tell Elizabeth. So Elizabeth ends up naming the child, which everyone's thinking, no, 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 don't do that because then he's off the hook, right? 
he, he, will, he, couldn't, he could have non-support for the next 18 years if you don't name him Zachariah. You're saying that he doesn't even own him because if you name him some gutter name, we don't even know. So you see how we're calling into question who the father is in this very sort of silly moment. Don't name him John. None of Zachariah's famous relatives. Remember last week we talked about how he had famous relatives and he's this and he's this and he's son of this and his uncle was this. He's royalty. And so's Elizabeth. Remember we had all of her ancestry in there too. And you didn't choose from any of those names, but you chose this name, John. And right at the moment that Zachariah buys into what the Holy Spirit is doing, his tongue is freed. And as soon as his tongue is freed, the crowd asks the question, what then will this child become? Now this is humorous, okay? Because they're asking this sarcastically. Do you see that, right? Uh, what's gonna happen to that? I already feel bad for that kid. His parents are a mess. His dad can not talk or he can talk. Uh, we don't know what's going on. They named him some gutter name and she named him and not him. They think, what is this child going to become? And what's really funny about that is you know what John the Baptist is going to become, right? Some crazy, rebellious guy on a motorcycle with tattoos out in Joshua Tree eating locusts and wild honey. And you know all of those little old Bettys are saying, I told you that kid was going to be no good. <laughs> they named him John, and they should have named him Zachariah. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, right? But of course, God's love always shows up as our irony. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. That's right. And God uses this question, and, and this is one of the reasons that I think the Gospels are truly inspired by God, by the, the Holy Spirit as a muse, because all of them tend to put words into the antagonist's mouths that are actually true, but not in the way that the antagonist said so. So they're asking the question, what will this man become? And the answer is that the first things that Zacharias says is this. Would you read this for us, Ralph? Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. So he's speaking to the child now, okay? For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Mary's Magnificat gets a lot of beautiful play, but how many of you honestly know this, or have heard this, really, even? We don't talk about this. This is the benediction, actually. Uh, this is also probably an ancient hymn, and in it, we get uh, some famous quotes, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, and then there's a whole litany of how God has provided the Savior, the salvation that we've been looking for, all right? So what's interesting here is that Luke is writing, okay, primarily for a Gentile audience, but also a gospel that is incorporating Jewish people and Gentiles. That's what's special about the gospel of Luke. So, for each group of people, the prophecy looks a little bit different. It looks like the prophecy that they have been waiting for. So, what's cool about that here is he's a descendant of whom? Of David. He showed mercy, promise to our ancestors. 
He has rem- remembered the Holy Covenant, the oath he swore to our ancestor. Who? Abraham. Abraham. That's right. So he's into that language. Now notice the Magnificat had all of that language about how the mighty will be thrown down and the lowly will be lifted up. None of that is in this one. Have you noticed that? Yeah. None of that good news shows up for the elite of Israel here. And yet, what God promises is still good news for all people. That's what I think is so cool. That's what I want to lift up to here. Also, I've highlighted two things in red because this drives me nuts. And, you know, the joke I always make is bad translations gives me really great job security because there is so much so poorly translated because these two things are actually saying the same thing. But do they look the same at all? He has looked favorably and dawn from on high will break upon us. Would you ever assume that those are the same word? No. Why the NRSV does this, I have no idea. I know you probably can't read this, but if you ever want to read Greek, you can go to BibleHub.com or just type in the words Greek interlinear, and that'll show you English and Greek. Now, if we were actually going to look at this, you would, you would, uh, you'd have to notice that the word order is different. And so sometimes in Greek, it's, it's a little bit hard to figure out what the subject of the sentence is versus the direct object, right? Okay, uh, Peggy's back there going, oh yeah, I remember some of that. But I just want to show you that this same word is in both of them. Epistikiwato. And it means to visit. Now, look back at this. Okay, he has looked favorably on his people and the dawn from on high will break upon us. Neither one of those say anything about visiting, does it? But the word is literally he has visited. Do you see this? Can you read this right here? He has, and the word down here says will visit. How did they take the word visit out? I don't understand. I don't understand this translation. But I'm bringing this up to you not to just show you that I think they're wrong, but because this is what the Gospel of Luke is about. If you're taking notes, if you're taking my exam, I would write this down. The Gospel of Luke is about hospitality. The Gospel of Luke is about hospitality. The Gospel of Luke is asking the question, will you show God your hospitality? And I want you to think about that from here on out. Everything we talk about is going to have to do with hospitality. All of the questions in Luke's Gospel where you get in trouble, it has to do with hospitality. The Good Samaritan is ultimately a story about hospitality. The Prodigal Son is about hospitality. The Lost Sheep is about hospitality. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do is about hospitality. The breaking of bread at the Lord's Supper is about hospitality. The road to Emmaus is about hospitality. And Jesus ultimately saying um, to the thief next to him, today you will be with me, is also about hospitality. And so the story that we're telling today is the story about how Mary, very pregnant, and Joseph travel all the way to the city of David because he is literally an ancestor of David. He should literally be treated like royalty there. And there's what? No No room in the inn. The story sets up that even when the child is being born, the one that's already been prophesied to be the Messiah, the one that the angel Gabriel literally came down and witnessed to several people saying, this is the one, he's coming, and he's in her belly, you need to treat him as a king. That same baby is born in an inhospitable place. And if, if hospitality is a gift that you have, uh, I think the church is the place for you. 
I think there is just so much great, great hospitality that happens in this congregation. Uh, I, it is one of the reasons that I really wanted to come here and be one of your pastors because your hospitality is fantastic. And I think you're going to see in this gospel a calling to hospitality that can take over every other divisiveness between us. And Luke will tell us that Jesus again and again sits down at the tables of all of the people that everyone else has assumed you cannot be hospitable to them and they won't be hospitable to you. But he actually goes up to Zacchaeus and says, hey, I'm coming to your house today. <laughs> Don't you love that? Right? Jesus impels us, compels us to be Hospi hospitality in the world, to be hospitable to those who need us. And by the way, the word hospital literally comes from the word hospitality. And they'll know if you thought about that in a while. So one question might be, will you show God your hospitality? But the deeper sort of meta narrative there, the, um, uh, what was that movement called? The, the transcendental idea here that's uh, deeper there and, and may require a late night, you know, where you're thinking about the cosmos is, will you let God in? Not just literally in your house, but will you let God in to your life? And you see that happen here where in the beginning of the story, Zechariah is literally in God's house. God is being hospitable to him. And right in that moment where he gets to the place, remember I told you that the, the in the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant, which is literally God's footstool, which means you are in the lazy chair presence of God, where God puts God's feet up. And in that moment, the angel Gabriel says to you, your wife is going to have a baby living inside of her, which is another way of saying your wife was once vacant and now is being hospitable. And he goes, uh, question. <laughs> and when that same angel goes to the margins of society to a little girl and says, God has looked at you with favor, for you're going to have a baby in your belly. She sings a song. That, sisters and brothers, is, I think, what the Gospel of Luke is about. This is from um, the book that I'm using um, most here. I thought about just holding it up for you, because I know maybe some of you would want it. I'm going to ask that we go through Luke together, uh, and then if you, if you like the book, then, then we can get the book. But um, it's a little theological, it's a little heady, and uh, I, I don't know, maybe this isn't the right decision, but I think if we just go through it and embody it, then we can get to the head. If we get the heart part first, then we can get to the head. But I think some of the head stuff might mess you up before, <laughs> before you get to the heart. But this is one of the quotes from that. The role before John the Baptist is already mentioned by Gabriel at his birth. He is to go before the Lord to prepare the path. Now think about hospitality, okay? Preparing the way of the Lord is also hospitality for a man who doesn't have, foxes have holes, right? <laughs> who doesn't have a place to lay his head. The way is the home of Jesus. It will consist in giving to the people knowledge of their salvation through the release of their sins. Luke's conviction is that people are saved when they know reconciliation through and through in their hearts. So if we go all the way back to what's, what Zacharias says to his son, he says this, You are called to be prophet." You will go before the Lord to prepare His ways. So much of Luke has to do with making the preparations, right? To prepare the way, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the forgiveness of their sins. 
knowledge of salvation by forgiveness of sins is essentially saying cleansing them of their sins in a way that they have room in their heart to host Jesus. That's what he's called to prepare to do. And gosh, if we don't say that every single Sunday, the, the idea that what we get from Jesus is forgiveness and reconciliation and new creation so that we can hold love and peace and joy and grace in our hearts, which is exactly what happens when you let God in. Okay. <clears throat> I told you that we were going to talk about the angel Gabriel. Now, I grew up in Texas, and in Texas, it's the University of Texas fight song. It's called The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You. From night till early morn, the eyes of Texas are upon you until Gabriel blows his horn. That, that's what I grew up. So, I always assumed that the angel Gabriel had something to do with UT football, but apparently it's also in the Bible. Who knew? But the angel Gabriel is not a often reoccurring character in the Bible. The angel Gabriel doesn't just show up on a whole bunch of smattering of pages. He actually only shows up in one book before Luke. And it is the best named book in the Bible, the book of Daniel. <laughs> in the book of Daniel, Daniel is a prophet. Remember I told you Daniel is a superhero? Do you remember that? Yeah. And so he can, he can discern things that even the king can't. And the kings and all of those, super, you know you're in a superhero book when the king is an idiot. Okay. If you read Ezra, the king is an idiot. If you read Daniel, the king is an idiot. You should know if you read Daniel and Bell the dragon, guess what? The king is an idiot. If you're in one of those, you should know that we're, we're promoting Jewishness by claiming that these people have superpowers. And one of Daniel's was that he could, ha he could discern dreams. So the king would have crazy dreams, and he would say, help me, Daniel, I don't know what this means. And Daniel would say, well, I can tell you what it means, but guess what? It's going to mean bad things for you, and then bad things would happen for the king. That's what happens in chapter 2. Here in, I think this is chapter 8, uh, the Daniel starts to have a dream. Okay, so we've moved from Daniel's a prisoner to Daniel is the aide of the king who has dreams to Daniel is now the dreamer, okay? That's, that's the final level of his superhero-ness. And he has a dream that even he doesn't know how to decipher. And out of the heavens comes an, an archangel named Gabriel. And Gabriel says, I know what your dream means. It means the end of the world is coming. And Daniel goes, okay, great. Thanks, Gabriel. So that's what happens, okay? That's the story of Gabriel, okay? So every time he shows up in Luke, they are terrified because Gabriel means the end of the world, okay? You know how some people read Revelation or actually don't read Revelation but think it's about the end of the world? Yes, you know that? Okay, for these people, that was the book of Daniel. It's the same kind of literature. It's apocalyptic. Who knows what it means? It's somewhere between uh, a bad drug overdose and a really weird dream written down on paper and some sort of religious experiment, you know, experience, something about peyote, right? It just, it feels like a Beatles song, right? It just, it, you know, I want to be under the sea in an octopus's garden. Tell me that they were sober when they wrote that. Somebody tell me that they weren't tripping on something. You don't think that if you're not experienced, you know what I mean? So Daniel is that same genre of octopus's garden, and so is Revelation. They are, they are trips, they're people tripping. That, I don't know how else to tell you that that's what's happening. But people believe that if you saw the angel Gabriel, it meant the end of the world is here. So, you get a bunch of stories where he shows up, and the first thing he has to say to everybody is what? Not Don't be afraid. Fear not. And every single time, they, they're still afraid, 
right? <laughs> he says, don't be, and they're like, mm, hi, you're the Grim Reaper. We know who you are. We know who you are. Okay, so I told you last week, and I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, um, to, to count out the weeks for you, but there, there's a saying about how many weeks it is in between the prophecy that Daniel has that Gabriel interprets in Daniel 8 and the end of the world, okay? That has to do with a number of weeks, all right? Pregnancy also has to do with a number of weeks. So the idea there is that from the time Gabriel talks to Zechariah and says, you're going to have a baby, and then Mary finds out she's going to have a baby, and then she goes to visit Elizabeth, who's exactly the same number of weeks it would take to add on to her 40 weeks that gets us to 70 weeks. That means that when, that when the angel Gabriel shows up on the day that Jesus is born, and he goes to the field to tell some shepherds, fear not. It's actually been the prescribed amount of time in numerology that the end of the world is here. Now that's supposed to be funny, okay? That gets lost on us in a bunch of asterisks and footnotes in our study Bibles, but the angel Gabriel is supposed to get you excited, okay? It's supposed to pique your interest. Anybody know how the play Macbeth starts? The three witches, okay? So the, the yeah, yeah, double, double, toil and trouble, right? And the three witches are up there and they're stirring the thing. Do you know the phrase, break a leg? It comes from the play Macbeth. It comes from the groundlings, which are the people who couldn't afford the fancy seats in the back. But actually, if you have ever been to the Globe, uh, I have, you'd much rather be a groundling. Surely you have to stand for three hours, but you're right there. It's so cool. So the idea was that there was a, this, this, the very front of the stage for the globe was pitched in a way that the groundlings, if you did a play that was really good, they were disgusting pigs and they would salivate. And their spit would actually pull, pool into the reservoir that would go down. So break a leg suggests that your acting was so good that they would salivate so much that you would actually slip on their spit and break your leg. Look it up. I'm not making this up. Look it up. The angel Gabriel is a break a leg for you. It's like the three witches at the beginning of Macbeth. It was supposed to make you so excited to find out what's going to happen because this is supposed to be a signal for the end of the world. So Gabriel shows up and every time he does, he says, fear not. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. Now, for us, that feels a little redundant, doesn't it? Right? What is the difference between being terrified and fear overwhelming you? Not sure, but they're building, they're building the moment here. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. But she's not afraid. Did it say that she was afraid? Perplexed. Perplexed. And she pondered these things in her heart. The feminist me has to tell you, she's not afraid. The text does not tell us that she's afraid. She doesn't respond how the men do, right? She just says, hmm, I wonder what kind of greeting this will be. <laughs> but then, in that region, there were shepherds living in fields, keeping watch of their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before him, and the glory of the Lord showed around. Anybody else hear Charlie Brown Christmas every time, every single time, every time you read it? And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you 
is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth. Peace to whom he favors. Now I told you that the angel delivers a prophecy specific for each group and that each group gets what they need out of it, right? Uh, and for Zechariah, it is that your prayers have been heard. And remember, his whole benediction was about how his ancestors had been promised things and now those prayers have been heard. But to Mary, who's a nobody, he says, you are favored. And to the shepherds, who've got nothing, they, they get a savior. So I didn't want you to miss that because I think that's a beautiful thing. It's a good reminder about what God does for us in Jesus, that what I'm forgiven of is not what you're forgiven of. The people I'm reconciled to are not necessarily the people that you're reconciled to. Uh, the way that I find room for Jesus in my heart and in my life are not necessarily the same prescription that you have for what God. And yet God's grace seems to cover all. And I, there's too much beauty in that. I didn't want to lose that. But clearly, fear not is supposed to be funny here. Do you, can you see that now, right? Every single time the guy shows up, he's like, oh, I'm so tired of these people. They, they always run away and like they don't listen because they're just trembling and stuff. Like, I, I, just once. I want to go out and not be a celebrity. Can't I just one time? All right. One more thing I want to say, two more things I want to say about the Zachariah piece before we, before we lose it entirely. I mentioned to you already, a, there's a story about somebody whose wife becomes pregnant in a very, uh, uh, when she's going up, up, up there in years, right? And that story is Abraham and Sarah. And those stories are very, very parallel because God comes to Abraham where? In the temple? No. Where? At his house, right? And before Abraham knows it's the Lord, he does what? He says, come on in. And when they invite God into the house, then God says, oh, by the way, your wife is going to have a child. And she names him Isaac, which means he laughs, right? Because she laughed. I mean, it was so laughable. But that's also a story about hospitality. So I, I don't want to miss that thread, okay? Because that's the same story that's showing up here. Uh, and one more thing. What was the other thing I was going to tell you about Zechariah? Oh, each of these three stories follows the same structure, okay? There is fear not, uh, and then there is a response. Then there's a child is born, is going to be born. Uh, and then there is some sort of reluctance, and it's okay. And then there's a sign, okay? So, for Mary, that sign was, the Holy Spirit is going to come visit you, all right? And for the shepherds, it, it is, you're going to see a star, and uh, you're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. But for Zechariah, the sign is that he's mute. And you could miss that easily. If you don't see that they're following the same structure, you might miss that. But the question that he answers, remember I told you so often in the Gospels, people ask the wrong question and then they ironically get a great answer. The last thing that he says before he's mute is, well, what kind of sign am I going to get? <laughs> and then what does God do? He is your sign. <laughs> you are mute. And then... Once that prophecy is fulfilled, then he writes, he is John. Then his voice is brought back. And it's a 
quality reminder for all of us that we all get different signs from God. We all get different prescriptions for what we need, but we all may, and we all make room for God on our own timetable. And the goal in the, in the Gospel of Luke is that you find a way to have God in you while you're still living in the promises, okay? That you live in the promises before they're realized, that you actually usher in a kingdom as it's being developed, that you actually get to be part of what God is doing rather than waiting on the outside. But Zechariah is a great reminder for us that God redeems all of us some of us are just a little more thick-headed than others. That's it. But I want to miss that theme also. All right. The birth of Jesus. This is Luke. We're all the way to chapter 2 already. Can you believe that? <laughs> In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration. It was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was a descendant from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. A lot of drama there. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to the firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. I just read the shepherd part to you. And we'll go down to the bottom, the th third paragraph there. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. Remember, made known to was what John the Baptist was also charged with, to tell people about the salvation that they already have. This has been made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And it notice it doesn't say Joseph and Mary. Isn't that nice? And the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The life, sisters and brothers, is living in the promise. The life is going to Bethlehem to see what has been promised for you. Your life is the journey that arrives where you meet God over and over and over again. It's not a wait and see game. It's a today game. Some notes about Luke. Uh, Luke has his history a little bit wrong here. This is why I'm stressing this is not a history. Um, Quirinius was not governor until 6 CE and Herod dies in 4. So the year that Caesar was Augustus and Herod was in charge and Quirinius is in charge didn't, there's not a year. That's, that's not a year that exists in any calendar. Um, we have two things here. One could be, okay, it's 75 years later. They have no really great history here. Maybe he's just wrong. Or maybe he doesn't really care. But the theme that he's getting at is that these people are under extreme oppression. And what better way than to say that you're oppression, you're oppressed, than to say, and the year when so-and-so was the mayor, and so-and-so was the governor, and so-and-so was the president, okay? All of those people are oppressing you. Anybody seen the movie Office Space, right? In the movie Office Space, one of the things he complains about is he has six bosses, right? <laughs> I have six people telling me what to do all the time. It's that layer of oppression because they don't all agree. Herod wants very different things than Caesar wants. Herod wants you to build the temple and tell him how great he is every day. And Caesar wants you to pay taxes to Rome and speak Latin, right? And Quirinius wants everyone to go to their homeroom class so that they can take attendance so that you can pay taxes. 
right? Let's be honest about what this is. And everyone would know what these three layers mean. You've got a, a, a religious political leader, that's Herod. Then you've got a guy who's trying to get everybody organized so they can oppress you. And then you've got a guy who's so far away, who puts his face on money and calls himself God. And somehow he's oppressing you too. You never met him. You never seen him. You don't know anything really about him uh, that you're supposed to call him God and Lord. All right. So I wouldn't get too caught up in the, is Luke just wrong here? I, I think he didn't try that hard to prove. I think what he was trying to do, maybe he couldn't find who was governor in the year zero. And Quirinius, he had an incomplete data and he just used that. I think that's probably the most likely thing that happened there. Okay. The irony, of course, again, this is the gospel using bad motives for good story is that it got Jesus' parents to return home, right? Uh, how many great movies of ours start with someone returning home and then they, then they have to relive their childhood. They, then they have to like grow up again. They, they have to face their demons, right? <clears throat> like 90% of chick flicks start that way, right? Somebody <laughs> goes home and then mom's like, oh, do you remember the little boy? Well, now he's gorgeous hunk and uh, <laughs> And uh, you should go with him and, and make glass. What's that movie? Sweet Home Alabama, I think, is that one. Yeah. Well, the, the, whatever. That, that movie's happened a million times, okay? But it, got, it gets Joseph and Mary to go to the town that he's from, and it aligns the stars for this story to happen. The time of year of Jesus' birth is definitely not December. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, okay? But the shepherds are outside at night, which you don't do in December. You don't sleep outside in December. You don't. The desert's cold at night. Anybody ever been to the desert at night? It's cold. They wouldn't be out in the fields at night if it were December. Moreover, anybody been to the Holy Lands? Is there a lot of grass there? No. If they're out in the fields, it's because there's grass out in the fields. That's why they're sleeping out in the fields, because there's grass to sleep on. If you have any chance of there being grass in the Middle East, it's definitely spring. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only option for it. Uh, of course, the use of December 25th is uh, rewriting an old holiday. It's like, look, the kids already have school off that day. Can we just, <laughs> can we just make that the day, okay? Uh, it's totally fine that we celebrate his birthday in December, but that date of December 25th is nowhere in scripture, super not there. But if you really wanted to know, the idea that the shepherds are out in the fields suggests that it's springtime, yeah. No room in the inn is also a poor translation. We actually know this because they have a room for inn. And Luke uses that word when he talks about the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan takes the man out of the ditch and he literally takes him to an inn and uses the word for inn. So what people often say is, well, Luke just didn't use the right word. Like Luke doesn't know how to use his own language, right? Which sounds really silly. But he actually does because later... <laughs> In chapter 11, he's going to use 11. He's going to use that, that, that word properly there. So the word is, uh, it doesn't quite resonate with us. Uh, the, the best I could think of is like a guest house, okay? There's no room in them in the family complex. But none of these would be nice places. That's why I hesitate to use pool house or guest house, right? because uh, it, it, there's no sign of luxury here. Uh, there's just a, a, there, there's a place for you. But the beauty of that is that it suggests that Jesus isn't even welcome in his own hometown, his dad's hometown. And later on, he's going to be in Nazareth, and he's going to get up and preach. And how's that going to go? Yeah. Not good. And he's going to say, see, a prophet's never welcome in their own hometown. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is not welcomed here. 
But again, the wrong motivation leads to the right story because Jesus, being born in the stable, which means he's not born in the city center where the elite have power. He's not born in a place where only the fancy feel comfortable. He's not born in a place where only the haves have and they, they, shun up, they turn up their nose to all those who don't belong. He's actually born out in the stable, which is the perfect place to be if what you want to do is run into a bunch of shepherds. It's actually the perfect place to be if you're telling the story of the marginalized being lifted up and the mighty being brought down low. The perfect place to be is to tell a prophecy about how the Messiah is coming and when he's actually entering the world, the elite couldn't find a way to have room for him in their heart or in their homes. They couldn't find a way to be hospitable to a woman giving birth. There's a great bumper sticker out there. I'm a big fan of bumper stickers. I don't know if you know this about me. Uh, I used to have a lot and then I got married and <laughs> that car is gone and all my great opinions are on a 1987 Toyota Corolla somewhere, some, somewhere. One of my favorite, my, this is a digression, but my favorite bumper sticker ever was mean people produce little mean people. And I, I think that's just, it's a categorically true, it's, it just proves itself, it's, it's just a syllogism, it's logical, it's obvious, and yet it happens everywhere. I don't know. Anyway, um, where was I going this? One of my favorite bumper stickers out there is, do you feel compelled Right, uh, to welcome an unwed teenage mo mother who's homeless. Well, of course you do, because that's the story of Jesus, right? An undocumented, uh, homeless, unmarried woman, young girl. That is the story. Uh, and that's, that, that narrative uh, is still alive and well with us, where it's so hard for us to want to extend hospitality to the other, right? but we're not invited to the birth when we're not hospitable. We're not, we miss it. We miss what God's doing when we're on the outside, or on the inside, rather. Whereas John was born in the in crowd, Jesus is born on the outskirts of the holiest city in the world. Love it. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. I just love it. It's great. Okay, then... Uh, what the angel Gabriel, remember I told you, each one gets a different flavor uh, when, they, when Gabriel talks. When he's talking to the shepherds, he uses the word Savior. And I want you to gloss over that, right? Uh, just because Linus is in your head. I don't, I don't want you to miss that the word Savior is special, okay? Messiah means, or Christ, it gets translated Christ, but it really would be Messiah, which means the anointed one or the chosen one. That, that's a leadership identification. The first person to be anointed like that is Aaron uh, in the benediction in, that happens in Numbers. You know that whole, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be, that's, a, that's from Numbers. That's from the, the blessing of Aaron. He's the first one to be considered consecrated as a leader, and he's given that designation. The, the idea of, uh, of Messiah as, as the prophesied one so there's anointed one, that's a leadership thing. Messiah is someone from the lineage of David, okay? So those are told to the different groups. And then when it comes to the shepherds who probably don't care about either of those other designations, he says, a savior is born to you this day in the city of Bethlehem, a savior who is Christ the Lord, who is also anointed. And that word savior would remind you of Moses. It reminds you of leaving slavery for freedom. So the Savior word here. So the juxtaposition of the angel Gabriel is he's supposed to bring in the end of the world, but actually what he brings is the end of the world order. And what he actually says is, is that you will be made free the same way that the Pharaoh had to give up grips on God's people. Now society is going to have to give up their idea that they are the only ones that have access to me. Because... Uh, Zachariah was literally in the place where you have access to God. 
and he was made mute. That was his sign. But God traveled all the way out to Mary in Nazareth. God traveled all the way to a barn in, outside of Bethlehem. And God travels all the way out, even to the shepherds in the fields, to say, you have been made free. So in some sense, the barn is the hospitality of the shepherds. Now we don't get in, we don't actually get that, then the shepherds left intentionally so that Mary could have the barn. But in some way, where Mary and Joseph and the baby found comfort was literally in the house, if you will, of the sheep and their shepherd. And so they're out in the field and when they say, oh, you need to go find the baby, they're like, oh, sweet, we know where the barn is. We know that place. And the manger is significant. Oh, so what Mary says in the Magnificat is that release of the captives. And Jesus says that. We're going to talk about that the first time next time. Manger is also significant in another way. This is a teaser that I'm not going to tell you about today uh, until later on. And you're going to be like, what? Uh, but here's, here's another one of them. The ox knows its owner and the donkey knows the manger of the Lord. But Israel does not know me. My people have not understood me. Remember that the call to John the Baptist was to help people know salvation. You remember that? Help people know that salvation is making room for God. All right, I'm out of time, but I'm going to go through these really quickly. Salvation was different for different people, but God's promise is to live, uh, our, our goal is to live into God's promise to be forgiven, to forgive, and to be reconciled, and that is what gives us salvation, and salvation means to be set free. If you're taking notes and you're going to take my exam, write this down. Salvation means to be set free. Salvation means to be set free. We don't have time to read uh, about Simeon and Anna because I was trying to make up for the, the video that was gone. But essentially what happens is right after Jesus is born, on the eighth day, there, it's the time to name him and there's no, there's no crowd at this one. Remember, there was a crowd. There was a crowd when John was named. There's no crowd here. There's just, you know, donkeys. And so uh, they just say, we're going to name him Jesus. Then they take him to the temple and uh, there's this ceremony of how Mary's made clean. We think that Luke, again, just doesn't really know what he's talking about because he's conflating two Jewish customs about the circumcision uh, of Jesus and the being made clean of Mary. Those are like weeks apart, and that's, but he just puts them together. Something about two turtle doves, we have no idea what he, we, have, we don't know where he's getting this from. <laughs> he's, got, he's got some bad Jewish intel, uh, but he's, he's telling the narrative the way that it got passed down to him, and that's, that's totally fine. But there are two prophets to show up here, Simeon and Anna, and hopefully you've heard of them before. Simeon rushes. They've been waiting at the temple. They're waiting for Messiah at the temple. They do this every day. As soon as they see Jesus, they rush up to him, and Simeon says, Finally, now I can retire. But it's in Greek. So it comes out as, Lord let your servant go in peace. Your words have been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared. Remember that's the, that hospitality word. In the, light, in the sight of all your people, a light to reveal you to the Gentiles, which is a weird thing for a Jew to say, and the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon has spent his whole life looking for a Messiah. And now, meeting Jesus, he has been set free. And the story of Anna is also a story of a woman who's a widow. She was married for seven years, y'all, and then she's been a widow to the age of 84. So, 18 to 84, basically. She's been going to the temple every day, waiting for a Messiah. And when she meets the baby, that's also to assume she probably didn't have any kids, right? When she meets the baby, she also is set free. She finds 
salvation there. So this part at the, bit, uh, the bottom here, um, gosh, I can't believe I'm out of time already, but uh, just give me two more minutes, okay? All right. What? Okay. All right. Uh, a sword will pierce your own soul too. So he's got this beautiful poem about everything's great for me now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, by the way, Mary, the, you know, this has been some great things for you, but also a sword's going to pierce you too. Sorry, got to go. See you. <laughs> Last thing that he says. He talks for all this, and he ends with a sword will pierce your own soul too. And Mary's like, man, what a weird guy. And then this thing with Anna, she says, when they finished every... Uh, um, at that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended, they started to return. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was with the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then, he started to, then they started to look for him among their relatives and their friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After how many? Three, Three days, they found him. They returned to, the, to Jerusalem uh, uh, sitting among the teachers. The word there is rabbi. Listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all of these things in her heart. That's that same phrase again. Now, what's going on in her heart? That's what I want to know. Yeah. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and in human favor. The sword, of course, that shows up in Simeon's prophecy is that Jesus also has a holy heavenly father and as much as he belongs in Mary's house so he also belongs in God's house and remember that picture that Raphael painted of her comforting him and him comforting her and both of them holding the scripture of the day that he will have to die and how hard that must be Jesus doesn't always give us what we want but he always gives us what we need and when we make room for him, it's not always on our terms. Sometimes it's on God's terms. So, sisters and brothers, thanks for hanging with us tonight. May you find hospitality to be one of the great joys in life. Have friends over, eat, drink, and be merry. And I'll see you in two weeks. Good night. Yeah, it's a two-week break. So, so we'll out three in three weeks. weeks.